Well, I'm the president of the Hip Hop Caucus, and the Hip Hop Caucus is now a organization that has uh, a database membership of over 700,000 people across the country. And this really excited to be here at Green Fest because we're really using this moment to energize, to organize, and to mobilize particularly young people in urban communities around this issue of going green or clean energy and what it means for them to uh, be a part of a movement that's moving from the civil rights movement to the clean energy movement for the 21st century. And so really we're just here just to be a part, to, to share in our enthusiasm for what it means to be a part of this movement, but also to stress the importance that this movement is not um, about equality. Um, it's, it, there are parts of equality, but the movement is mostly about existence. And if we don't get this movement, if we don't get active now, 10 years into the 21st century, then there could be some serious consequences for the rest of this year, rest of this decade, but for the 22nd, 23rd, 24th centuries as well. Well, Hip Hop Caucus, you know, we, we use one's cultural expression to form one's political experience. And, you know, I got involved with hip hop. Uh, politics uh, with me and my good friend P. Diddy and Russell Simmons were out getting out to vote in 2004 and we saw in, from New York how good it was to see people active and but we recognized that um, we weren't at the table and one of the things that we say at the Hip Hop Caucus is that either you are at the table or you are on the menu there's no in between and so we had to be at the table so we created Hip Hop Caucus we got an office in D.C., we begin to organize, and we begin to really get people more engaged, let them know that democracy is not a spectator sport, and you got to be engaged in the process. But as things would have it, when we first got started in 2005, the year after 2004, Katrina hit. And I think Katrina was one of those moments for our generation. It was those moments that I think that really pushed us. And for the hip-hop community, which is black, it's white, it's brown, it's yellow, it's red, male, female, straight, gay, atheist, theist, all, as I would say, all of God's children, all of humanity, really engaged in this culture um, after the boomers. I think that the hip-hop generation really began to move forward to being a part of the solution and being solutionary and fighting for the rights of Katrina survivors. Now, for me, being from Louisiana, it was even more personal. So we began to just organize the people down there in New Orleans. But then we begin to see that we gotta do with the policies. Because either you shape policies, the policies shape you. It's the reason why people were left behind. It's the reason why we were spending monies for war and not for to build the, the levees. It's the reason why my good friend Al Gore said we had this inconvenient truth. And so we began to really begin to push and figure out policies. And so since then we begin to see that there's a link. It's a link between the, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, dealing with oil. It's a link between now what's going on in the Gulf Coast. It's a link. And we use hip hop as a mechanism to get out that word, to use that culture, use that spirit, use that poetry, use that power. Use our generation to make sure that we can have our message and our way of communicating that message as well. Well, I mean, we've been very fortunate. It's about the people. And I think that it's, the one of the hip hop caucus is that it's, it's about young people, so it's their voice. And so you hear it from them. But the one thing I think that we've done recently was our Hip Hop Caucus Clean Energy Now Tour, and which we did in February, in which we were out going around, started in New Orleans, and went from New Orleans to Arkansas, from Arkansas to Missouri, then to Indianapolis, Indiana, to Ohio, and then back to DC. And I think that the key thing there that we really want to spread the message of how could we rebuild our economy, um, how could we reclaim our communities, and how we could restore our planet. And I think it was so important for us to use hip hop to get the word out there. And, and obviously working with Al Gore, you know, kind of helps a little bit his organization, the Alliance for Climate Protection, Repower America, but it's even more than that. He would begin to see hip hop caucus as one of the true vehicles, one of the true, really, organizations for the 21st century. And we don't take that lightly. Uh, you know, this year, uh, we've dealt with uh, earthquakes in Haiti. Uh, this year we've had disasters in the Gulf Coast with, in the, with BP, and now 200,000 gallons of oil spewing out. Uh, this year we've seen tragedies from police brutality to lack of jobs. We've seen so much, and we know that this is our moment. And so we don't take it lightly. As I told so many of our generation that, you know, Dr. King was important, 
So is Malcolm X. So is Harry Belafonte, Muhammad Ali. But you are more important than them because while they were fighting for equality, you're fighting for existence. And if you lose this battle, the children of the future will lose their lives. And so we got to do so much more. And so hip hop, I think, recognizes that. So we got a lot of artists who get engaged with this process from Common to John Legend to D. Woods to Bismarcky. There's so many. But it's more than just artists, it's about the people. Because again, it's about solidarity, not charity. The first thing is this, if in 2110, when you and me, unless they found some new kind of drugs, uh, we'll probably not be here. If there are people who can see this tape and they can breathe, then we would have been successful. Um, but in that history of our country, that continuously puts profits before people, that continuously puts you know, companies before communities. Um, and that where we've, we have overcome slavery, but we still have the remnants of slavery. We've overcome women's suffrage, but we still have women who still make less pay. We have gay right activists who are still being persecuted because of their sexual orientation. When you still have that, and you still have companies who are using, using that and manipulating the process, then you don't know. And again, I can't guarantee. All we can do is continue what we've always done, where we've organized, we've mobilized, and we've energized people. Uh, we've taken very seriously our time on this planet. We use our resources like your camera or our organization or whatever we have at our, at our, as our tools to go out here and fight for the people. And hopefully, sometimes we lose, and we see that with the war in Iraq and with the other wars. And sometimes we win, we see gains uh, at the ballot box and new presidents. So we see. I, I, I can't make guarantees, but I do know this. Again, if 100 years from now, 2110, uh, that generation, after probably fossil fuels have run out and, they, and we have been to transition, if that generation is watching this tape and seeing this and they understand what we overcame, then they recognize that we would have been at least to some degree successful. There's a shift. I mean, there's still, unfortunately, there, we can still have environmental apartheid, uh, where a lot of our communities and are still divided. Uh, you have the communities who have the whole foods, and you have the communities that have the no foods. <laughs> and then for some people, whole foods means whole paycheck. So, you know, uh, it, it can be very difficult in this process. Um, I think it's changing, though. I think that the one thing that people are recognizing now is that, there, that we are shifting, that we must shift from a fossil fuel economy to a clean energy economy. And I think that people from all parts, all communities, I think recognize that, we, that everybody can be at the forefront of this paradigm shift. Uh, it is true, the progressive movement um, has been a, at times, been a, pro, a segregated progressive movement. You can go to the immigration rally and be all brown. You can go to Sometimes to the Earth rally, be all white. You go to the police brutality rally, it's all black. And honestly, if we continue to be a segregated progressive movement, we won't succeed. But I do find hope. I do think young people in particular, I think, recognize that this is their movement, that they have an impact for future generations. And I do think that because of the hip hop generation, that you do have a sense that, that we are much more comfortable with one another. That we are black and white. It's, 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 it's brown and yellow, we do, we do come together. Matter of fact, we love each other. We actually, we, we, we don't, there isn't that same friction. So I think because of that, this movement being a rec recognized this is for future generations, that we are engaging it differently. And I think there's hope in that. I mean, it's, there's still problems. You know, there's still racism, there's still classism. We still have those, definitely have those problems. But I think that our generation, because it is this, I think that particularly we, we do care, we work together. So I wouldn't be surprised to see a bunch of all white kids in Chicago fighting for the black kid who got beat up. I wouldn't be surprised by seeing the black kids who are at University of Chicago fighting for you know, green jobs. I wouldn't be surprised by that. In fact, it happens. So I think that we are moving. So I think that our, our history as a country, which has had a, as at times had a terrible report of how it has treated the citizens, 
And, but I do think also the people of this country have responded every time from you know, the peace movements, civil rights movements, the gay rights movements, the women's suffrage movements, people have responded. Now I think the problem is this, if the people stop responding or they think that their government is the only solution or they feel like things are going to be okay, then we would have lost and we're in trouble. And then the companies would have won. Uh, I like to say this, this little thing that people always ask me all the time. They say, well, Rev, you mentioned all the time about the civil rights movement in the 20th century and hip hop movement in the 21st century. What do you mean by that? I say, well, you know, our parents fought Jim Crow. And you know, Jim Crow, our parents actually beat Jim Crow. But you know, uh, our parents had us, but Jim Crow had kids too. <laughs> and Jim Crow's kids are much more sophisticated. I like to say, I like to call him, uh, as a matter of fact, James Crow Jr. Esquire. <laughs> and, and James is, doesn't care if we march, we come together. James Crow got a drop top BMW, drinking Starbucks lattes up in the largest buildings. James ain't this white, James is all colors. But James recognizes that it's still against disenfranchising people. For profits. And until and we must recognize, our generation must recognize that it's not just about marching anymore, it's about coming together to really change policy. Once that happens, and we recognize what has formed this country using the policies, using legislation, then we will go forward. If we move away from changing legislation, move away from changing policy, then we're in trouble. We will not see progress at all. Yeah, no, I was a, I was a Air Force chaplain um, who was uh, uh, here stationed in uh, Andrews Air Force Base in D.C. And I began to recognize that the war at that time, we were speeding toward after 9-11. And we were speeding on this, on this reckless terror campaign and fear campaign and, and this, this war. And if we were wrong, knowing the power that we possessed through our military, that hundreds of thousands, millions would be the place, but thousands would die. And if we were wrong, you know, that would be a scar on my generation for humanity, because you can't bring those people back. Well, if I talk now, I know, unfortunately, that I was right. And millions have now died, beautiful brown people um, in the Middle East, and millions are still displaced. Uh, children who haven't been to school now in six, seven, eight years, still hurting. So much has gone on. But back then, I began to speak out. And uh, it, you know, when you're in the Air Force and you're an officer, speaking out against war might not be the best career move. Uh, might, not be, might not be what I would suggest uh, to any young officers out there, you know, if you're <laughs> looking to go up that totem pole in the military. But again, you should, your oath also is to uh, protect our country from foreign and domestic enemies. And so I think you have a right to also speak out and speak truth to power. And so I did, and I began to go through uh, so many uh, problems where people were, uh, I began, to, you know, they began to attack and, uh, you know, attack me. I did, but in the process of going through that, I began to keep speaking out, I wouldn't stop. So what I did was that I reached out to a lot of organizations about the peace movement. That's when I began to see was, again, it was mostly kind of white peace movement. And I uh, began to speak out and get them engaged. And they weren't engaged. And so I said, well, if there's an institution that's engaged in the peace movement, then I had to go out and then create one. And so sure enough, we, uh, Hip Hop Caucus at that time, began to work for peace and create this Make Hip Hop Not War tour. Uh, which was successful, but and lo and behold, I won my case. Uh, I, uh, I was found to get honorably discharged, but it came with a cost. Uh, one of those, I guess, I've got one of those YouTube moments that's famous now, where I went to the General Petraeus hearing on Capitol Hill, and I, um, I recognized when I'm, uh, when uh, when generals lie, uh, soldiers and people die. So I went to speak out and wanted to go to the hearing, but me being an officer and a few other officers who was being against the war went. Um, I, uh, they wouldn't let us in. And then, uh, you know, the officers began to beat us. And they beat me, and they uh, actually shattered my ankle. Um, so 
to this day, I have like a little bit of a limp. Uh, I got my Adidas on, keep a little soft, but it hurts, and there's pain, and I'll forever live with that. But um, it's got nothing on the people who I met in Jordan, the mother whose house was bombed, whose legs were blown off, and has no stomach. Um, has nothing on the little boy I met whose half his face is gone um, because of shrapnel. So it's okay. Um, because we got to keep uh, speaking truth to power. And I think now within this, we connect all those dots between no war, no warming. We now see the connection between what it means to have this addiction to, to fossil fuels and foreign oil and then the global warming. And I think as we begin to connect the dots, we begin to see that we can solve it. If we can curb our addiction to fossil fuels, then we can also then be in a position where we can uh, you know, save our planet, but also we can stop having these wars as well. So yeah, that's kind of my story. It's, uh, it's uh, now, you know, I'm launching campaigns at the White House. It's a little different arena, but it's still um, one in which it's not glorious because I could never bring back those Iraqis. Um, I could never restore back their land. I could never put back their antiquity. Um, I can't restore back the education that children lost. But for us, um, as a people here in this country, who have so much power to speak out and to speak truth to power, then we must continue to do so, no matter what. The peace movement and the green movement need to be one and the same. It must be one and the same. Um, you know, one of the key things is our addiction to foreign fossil fuels. And so, you know, we're going at war for these fossil fuels. And so we can connect the dots and then put more pressure um, on us going to war um, for these fossil fuels or curb our addiction to it, and it can have such a huge impact on that as well. Yeah, no, well, first let me say this. I, I mean, I, I'll say that I would love to make my job a lot easier if the artists who are in hip hop would talk about the issues that we're fighting for. Um, my job at the Hip Hop Caucus is so much easier when the people when we go out to them so oh yeah I just heard Drake's song on clean energy oh that was hot you know I mean that was crazy you know um, you know uh, or I heard you know uh, comment oh yeah comment about police brutality or most deaf to about Katrina or oh, that, that, that things do happen and it would be great I mean hey, listen I know uh, we did a campaign with T.I. and Keisha Cole I love for my good friend T.I. to do more uh, records and CDs. I would love for Waka Flocka uh, to uh, to do it. I encourage. I know Waka Flocka's mom, but I would I, if he, Waka Flocka's looking at this. I would love you, Waka. You make my job a lot easier if you're out there discussing issues that affect our community. Um, but I'll say this: um, as an artist, um, some artists are putting forth that music. Um, some mainstream, some not. My good friend of Moral Technique is out there doing that. My good friends from Dead, Dead Prez, M1, Stickman, um, you know, uh, Chrisette Michelle, uh, Raheem Devon, Ludacris is doing some things around the clean energy movement, John Legend, and so The Roots. So I have some. Most Deaf, Common, I'll be with pretty soon. Uh, so I, I have some. I would love to have more. So I'm not cutting off anybody. You, uh, the movement is we got tons of room in the tent. but. The question is that do what I need more of my, our Harry Belafonte's, um, our Eartha Kitts, um, you know, do we, do we, our Muhammad Ali's? Yes, so athletes as well. But the thing though is that I also know that buffoonery and blackface is not new to hip hop. And so for having artists and for having those people who are, you know, listen, uh, super uh, 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 dolomite and, uh, uh, I, I think Superfly, that thing, I, I, I can't remember the, uh, the other one, but I know Dolomite and the other ones, but uh, uh, blackface is not a new thing, and buffoonery is not a new thing. And when you can make, and when you have a million dollar industry off of poverty, you know, unfortunately sometimes the, the manifestations of that are going to be to continue to show the impoverishment, or as I would say sometimes the conspicuous consumer, consumerism. Um, so, you know, that, 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 that comes with it, and it's not new. But our job at Hip Hop Caucus is that as we can become much more political, as we continue to engage them, 
as we work with TI. So when we had our voting campaign last year, it stripped up my vote, and TI was still on the house arrest, and I called him up to be engaged in the process, because I, I recognized, listen, if TI could be about voting, then I've cut away all the excuses. <laughs> Because <laughs> he's, and lo and behold, actually he could vote. Worked out, he was in between Atlanta, he actually voted. Uh, he was actually before prison. And, and hopefully when Little Wayne comes out, I talked to Little Wayne before he went in, uh, you know, and, you know, about the Green Movement. And hopefully when he comes out, he'd be good. But we just got off tour with Drake. We got, we talked to Drake. And Drake actually went on tour, did a whole tour. that He greened his entire tour. So it's working. It is working. So. I'm not going to sit up here and, sit and get caught into, you know, a lot of news media likes to do and bash. I'm not going to do that. I look at all these artists in particular as having tremendous gifts. And I would love to see them use their gifts, their God-given abilities to empower. You can make money and you can do it, but use that a gift and ability to move the people forward. Well, you know, Hip Hop Caucus has grown. We're now as, uh, you know, from 2005, we're members of the Black Leadership Forum, uh, which is also the NWCP and Urban League. And they're, and they're good friends, so make sure I want to see my good friend, Ben Jels, NWCP and Mark Murray out at Urban League. But, as you know, uh, we are the fastest growing entity. You know, we've grown from the original 900 people in 2005 to over 700,000 people. Half of our membership um, was born in the 80s. So it's pretty, pretty exciting. Uh, um, to be in that position. Uh, what we want to continue to do is we want to continue to have the resources to meet that. We, we sometimes feel like, uh, we feel like that 16-year-old kid who was uh, uh, five feet when summer started, and by the time summer ended, he was like 5'7 to 5'10, and his mother still got him in those clothes. Um, so it feels so we're growing so fast that, you know, we, now we, we're, and it, and it can be a little embarrassing, a little, you know, revealing, because we don't have all the, all the, all the state coordinators and all the street team and all. So we want to grow. We want to meet that. We want to empower. And the Hip Hop Caucus, one of our missions um, is I'm glad I'm here. Um, I'm glad I was chosen. But key, key for us is empowering particularly young people, um, young people in urban communities. Definitely want to, definitely want to empower our young women. Uh, one of the things in the civil rights movement was very patriarchal. And unfortunately, young women and women have been uh, are so powerful to any movement, but they're not just to be on the back, but to be at the forefront of the movement. That voice is critical, and not to be a part, but to lead the movement. So if I call, I want to see more women leading. Um, uh, you know, we have, you know, great advisory council. Uh, Barbara Lee is on our advisory council, Maxine Waters. So we have, that's one push. Um, as well as we want to see, you know, more people coming together from different races and different backgrounds and you know obviously want to keep growing you know here in the states but around around the world as well we're beginning to have a little bit of following in different countries which is pretty exciting as well we're getting people from liberia and and uh we have people in venezuela and trinidad and and south south, south africa so it's kind of in france uh one of our people just is not coming back from france so you know, so it's exciting, it's exciting, but I think it's also about the time. I think that the people will mobilize themselves. They, again, they recognize the seriousness of this time. They have seen and lived through Katrina. They have been through two wars. And while they might not be directly connected, they know and they grieve because people who have died because of Americans' tax dollars. This year we had Haiti. They saw the devastation. And I think there's something about us now that they need to, and they understand the importance of mobilizing at this moment. I think they, they recognize that. And so my job was actually not that hard. It's, it's not, I don't have to do a whole lot of selling, uh, you know, to talk about getting gas. I think they just need to know the vehicle. And I think once it's there, and once it's back to sharing with the people, not just being institutionalized, just being in business for being in business, but sharing with the people and allowing them to be a part of this movement, we grow. So hopefully by 2012, we might eclipse a million people. That's kind of one of our goals. Uh, who knows? We will see. And then I think, uh, but, you know, and I will say this too. If the Hip Hop Caucus only lasts until 2020, and it's like SNCC, doesn't exist anymore, I'm fine with that too. I think that one of the things there is that we are also in a position where 
If it lasts, it lasts. But as long as we are fighting for the people, then we're okay with that. That's our goal. And so, you know, we'll see. But that's Hip Hop Caucus. You know, it's funny, when I'm out there, um, <laughs> you know, when I first got involved with the hip-hop movement, um, and before, now I get on TV a little bit, one of the hardest things for me personally, people always say, was it hard for you when you were uh, fighting with the Air Force and fighting against war? It actually was, wasn't that bad. One of the hardest things for me was that there would be churches when I became involved with hip-hop. This is around 2004, 2003, uh, who wouldn't have me speak. Um, I would get up there to a church. I mean, I listen, I got a master's in divinity. You know, I speak, read Hebrew and Greek, Arabic, you know, but I would get up to a church. I mean, they would mention Reverend Yu at Hip Hop Caucus. They would, they would shut out and they wouldn't invite me. And that was hard. It was actually, that was one of the hardest things. And, you know, but. It's okay because I think as time went on, I think that that's also for me is like the God that I serve um, follows and is the God of the oppressed. And if you are truthfully following God and you're not aligned with the oppressed, you're not aligned with the oppressed, if you're in the suites and not in the streets, then maybe, you know, that ain't, that's not the kind of God as they said to those when they were when they were, when I guess Christopher Columbus was over there in the Bahamas and he was burning the Native Indians and the, the priests would come up for, and before they would put them to the stake and burn them, and he says, you have one last minute, the first time ever getting, coming to Christ, you have one last minute before you can become a Christian. And it, uh, the Indian, one, one famous Indian replies back, he says, uh, are, do all Christians go to heaven? He says, yes, all Christians go to heaven. And the Indian responds, well, I'd rather go to hell. And I think that it's time for us, the people of faith, if you're Muslim, Christian, Jew, Buddhist, for people to see your faith and to feel your faith and to feel your love for all of God's children, to see it again, to see you fighting for them. Once they see that, you can be the most staunchest atheist to whatever, you're still going to be compelled to that mission. And so for me, what does faith play? Faith is the thing that is the fuel that allows you to push forward to fight when you shouldn't be fighting anymore. And for me, it's key in my life. And I love it now. I love it with my fitted. I love it with my collar. I love being me. And that's how God made me. <laughs>